بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ذا شولدر وطو اكزامين ذا شولدر تندونز لجمنز بونز لبرم برسي تندونز ار فايف فور فور ذا روتيتور كف 3 for the rotator cuff proper and 1 subscapularis so we have supraspinatus tendon, infraspinatus tendon and the teres minor tendon and the subscapularis muscle and tendon and then the biceps tendon ligaments all are glenohumeral ligaments inferior, middle and superior bones, acromion and glenoid humerus and the clavicle Libram six parts posterior superior posterior inferior antero superior antero inferior superior and inferior bursa subacromial subdeltoid subscapularis bursa subcoracoid bursa if you look here we have two bursa related to bones, acromion and cracoid, and two bursa related to muscles, subdeltoid and subscapularis. So this is easy to remember. Subacromial subcracoid, subscapularis subdeltoid. And then we have three synovial joints. The main shoulder is the glenohumeral. And the clavicle has two attachment, one to the sternum, one to the acromion. So we have sternoclavicular joint, acromioclavicular joint. These are the parts to be searched for. Three rotator cuff tendons plus subscapularis and biceps. So all are five. Ligaments, glenohumeral ligament, inferior, middle, and superior. Bones. Scapula, acromion, and the glenoid, humerus, and the clavicle. Labrum, six parts, posteriorly superior and the inferior, anteriorly superior and the inferior, and superior and the inferior. Bursa, two related to the bones, subacromion, subcoracoid, two related to the muscles, subdeltoid, subscapularis, and the shoulder joint, glenohumeral. And two joints attached to the clavicle, the sternoclavicular and the acromioclavicular joints. So, what are the components of the rotator cuff? Supraspinatus, infraspinatus, subscapularis, and teres minor tendons. Subscapularis anteriorly, infraspinatus posteriorly, supraspinatus above the spine, and teres minor below the spine, below the teres, below the inferior. Uh, the infraspinatus. The biceps tendon is traversing along the biceps receptor groove and has an attachment to the superior glenoid and superior labrum. These are the muscles forming the Rotator cuff, supraspinatus, infraspinatus, teres minor, deltoid, posteriorly there is the triceps, and anteriorly there is the subscapularis and biceps. <coughs> Another view showing that the, the clavicle has a chromium attachment, a chromium clavicular joint and sternal attachment, sternoclavicular joint and then this is a crocoid, this is a humerus and going to the greater tuberosity are the subscapularis, supraspinatus, infraspinatus and teres minor last muscle to attach from anterior is the subscapularis beneath the and along at the under surface of the scapula and 
this is a chromium this is a clavicle this is the superior or the supraspinatus tendon and this is the biceps tendon in ultrasound we will face the fat the deltoid the supraspinatus tendon reaching to the greater tuberosity and these are the bones the humeral head so we can define the supraspinatus tendon at and at its insertion into the greater tuberosity in MRI we have this sagittal view sagittal view showing the acromion uh, <coughs> anteriorly is the subscapularis under the, coming from under surface of the scapula uh, posteriorly there is the supraspinatus and the infraspinatus anterior spinal supraspinatus infraspinatus anterior spinal supraspinatus infraspinatus anterior spinal so the one liable to be f f injured from acromial uh, lesions as also arthritis or abnormal shape of the acromion or what is, what is called as impingement the one liable to be injured is the supraspinatus muscle and tendon and here's the region of the biceps so if you follow this subscapularis tendon muscle and tendon biceps bi biceps tendon supraspinatus under the acromion then infraspinatus and lastly the teres minor and all are covered with the deltoid muscle posterior and anterior. This is the posterior part of the deltoid and this is the anterior part of the deltoid and here will be the lateral part of the deltoid. Again to repeat again in the, in the sagittal just beneath the acromion is the supraspinatus tendon muscle and tendon posteriorly is the infraspinatus anterior minor and the posterior part of the deltoid and anteriorly the deltoid and underneath is the subscapularis muscle and tendon in between the three posterior and the one anterior is the biceps tendon reaching to the glenoid superior margin of the glenoid and superior labrum this is a coronal showing the from anterior this is a subscapularis sub muscle and this is a crocoid and a and uh, clavicle <coughs> part of the clavicle joining to the acromion head biceps tendon deltoid the supraspinatus muscle will more will appear more as you are going posteriorly more posterior this is the supraspinatus muscle and tendon reaching to the greater tuberosity this is the deltoid muscle and this is the uh, head femoral head Superior labrum, inferior labrum, this is a glenoid. These are the more, uh, uh, I mean, the most important things to remember. Of course, don't forget the acromioclavicular joint. In the axial view, we can see what is anterior and what is posterior. The Posteriorly is the infraspinatus, and this is the subscapularis, of course, humeral head and biceptal groove, and covering all is the deltoid muscle. Now, what happened to the rotator cuff to be searched for? The first thing is the tendinopathy, and second is the calcification, which can occur as unknown as calcific tendinitis. The tendon will become thickened with decreased signal intensity on all pulse sequences. Rotator cuff may be partial 
tear may show partial tear and the fluid is not traversing the whole tendon but may be bursal, interstitial or articular either towards the articular surface or towards the acromion what's called as the bursal and maybe inside the tendon itself and this is called interstitial it may be fully torn full thickness tear and the whole thing may affect uh, I mean lesions may affect the nerve supply and called denervation syndrome in which the muscle supplied by these nerves will become hyper intense in T2 and may be atrophic and finally we should be able to uh, recognize a subscapular stair so in brief it may be tendinopathy tendinitis muscalcification partial tear complete tear muscle atrophy and muscle denervation syndrome due to cut of the nerve supply and finally subscapular stair This one is showing the normal supraspinatus muscle and tendon reaching to the greater tuberosity, supraspinatus muscle and tendon reaching to the greater tuberosity. So here we have some abnormal intensity. Within the Supraspinatus tendon. This is called degeneration. It may be due to shrinkage, atrophy, and here we get increased signal intensity in all pulse sequences, but there is no complete or partial tear. Only such thickening and uh, increased intensity, and this is called tendinopathy <clears throat> partial tear may be articular may be bursal may be interstitial so what is this? this is partial tear because some fibers are continuous with some bursal fluid seen within here this is a supraspinatus muscle retracted and the space here is filled with fluid so and nothing is attached to the greater tuberosity this is complete there with retraction it's another complete tear the muscle, supraspinatus muscle is not going to the greater tuberosity. The supraspinatus muscle is retracted and nothing here. And the space is filled with bursal fluid. This is complete tear. Another massive supraspinatus tear with retraction. Showing defect filled with bursal fluid. Here the region of insertion where we find some calcification. This is supraspinatus tendon calcification near to the greater tuberosity, supraspinatus tendon calcification, and this is called tendinitis or calcific calcification tendinitis. Here another one calcification tendinitis. Uh, exuberant bone formation maybe it's a small maybe larger now so long we mention about calcification tendinitis we should mention about precipitation disease calcium pyrophosphate precipitation disease or arthropathy may be asymptomatic may have acute symptoms subacute symptoms or chronic symptoms or causing acute synovitis this is called calcium 
pyrophosphate precipitation disease and if you look to this you will find that at the insertion of the tendon at the insertion of the tendon there is definite fluid here and there is definite something there here of low intensity in this region mind you that all or most of sobra spinatus tendon rupture at its insertion at the greater tuberosity is due to calcium pyrophosphate uh, precipitation disease occurring in old age so such an appearance in old age is not due to sport injury or, or not due to abnormal movement or heavy movement or something like that it is due to precipitation disease at the insertion of the tendon at the greater tuberosity and thus making this area uh, uh, defective of tendon as it is replaced by calcium pyrophosphate uh, precipitation and thus rupture or tear will, will result. So any tear near to the greater tuberosity in old age is due to calcium pyrophosphate precipitation disease. We we'll repeat again this uh, this part. Calcium biophosphate precipitation arthropathy may be asymptomatic, acute, subacute, or chronic. And in old age, it occurs at the insertion of the tendon into the greater fibrosity, making this area weak area, susceptible for any minor trauma to form to to uh, result in rupture of the tendon at its insertion in the uh, greater tuberosity. So in old age, any tear of the sobrous spinatus tendon near to its insertion at the greater tuberosity is due to calcium precipitation disease, calcium pyrophosphate precipitation disease. And Previously, we were not using MRI. Before the advent of the MRI, we were, we were using the plain film and we usually find calcifications at this area. So, calcific tendinitis or such an appearance or such an appearance are due to calcification within the tendon or due to calcium pyrophosphate deposition disease occurring in old age and beforehand we were, we were calling this as supraspinatus tendinitis and this is a famous image seen in supraspinatus tendon rupture due to calcium pyrophosphate uh, degeneration disease, uh, precipitation disease. The next one is the idiopathic denervation syndrome. Here, for example, this is a deltoid, and the deltoid here is showing high T2 signal. And finally, it may, may end in atrophic change. Nerve severing, the nerve is cut if in trauma, it's called traumatic nerve severing, or any cervical spine disease due to nerve compression, diabetic neuropathy, non-specific myositis can result in such an appearance, or trauma to the muscle. So there are some reasons due to the muscle itself, trauma to the muscle, or non-specific myositis, and there is something related to the course of the nerve at the, at the cervical spine, cervical spine disease, or trauma to the nerve, or in diabetic neuropathy. Of course, all of this will result in denervation of the muscle, denervation of the muscle. If recent, it will be showing high T2 uh, intensity, while if it is uh, chronic, it may result in atrophy and low intensity. The 
the under surface of the scapula there is the subscapularis and this is the appearance of subscapularis rupture this is the axial showing the anterior and posterior glenoids and the deltoid around and this is the subscapularis tendon of course the opposite one here will be the inferior spinatus muscle liberal lesions and the glenohumeral instability we should remember this appearance antero posterior uh, antero superior antero inferior postero superior postero inferior superior and inferior as we said there are three parts for the labrum to be discussed and uh, uh, as regard the glenohumeral instability Generally, we should think about the capsule which is uh, containing the joint itself or uh, outlining the joint and this capsule may be uh, thickened in the hypertense and this is called the frozen shoulder and it is, uh, will be seen as fuzzy thickened capsule like that, hyperintense in T2 and this is adhesive capsulitis which result in inability to move the shoulder and this is called the frozen shoulder. This is tenosynovitis of the biceps. Here there is uh, the glenoid and there is the uh, posterior, this is anterior and there is here a uh, liberal tear, cyst arising from the liberal tear and this is called liberal cyst. The most common lesions involving the labrum are occurring at the anteroinferior part or the anterior labrum and this is called anterior liberal tear and the anterior liberal tear is usually accompanied with inferior glenohumeral ligament tear inferior glenohumeral ligament tear so the most frequent are combined anterior liberal tear with inferior glenohumeral ligament tear and both constitutes 95% and these are due to anterior dislocation of the shoulder and usually the dislocation is antero-inferior so antero-inferior dislocation or subluxation of the shoulder will result in anterior inferior, anterior inferior instability or antero-inferior instability which involve the anterior labrum and the inferior glenohumeral ligament. Anything involving the, the labrum anteriorly and the, the glino, inferior glenohumeral ligament uh, with each other is called bankart. So bankart is detachment of the inferior glenohumeral ligament and the anterior labrum at the anterior or antero inferior part of the glenoid following anterior dislocation with complete disruption of the scab uh, scapular pillars. This is the definition of the fibrous bankard. But in the same time, part of the bone may be involved. If you uh, remember how dislocation occurred, there will be disruption of the labrum and impaction of the head and this is called a glenoid rim fracture or, or hill sacs impaction deformity so antero superior antero inferior dislocation will result in antero inferior liberal detachment with infro, inferior glenohumeral ligament detachment both the infro, inferior glenohumeral ligament and the anterior labrum are detached and this is called fibrous banker the impaction itself will result in glenoid rim fracture and hill sacs deformity also, of course the hill sacs deformity will be reversed
if this is anterior inferior to the other hill sacs due to impaction is posterior superior humeral head posterior superior humeral head so here we have part of the bone fractured the inferior glenoid and this is according to the definition associated adjacent glenoid rim fracture will form what we call osseous pancreas. So we have again lesions of the anterior labrum and lesions of the inferior glenohumeral ligaments are due to dislocation and subluxation. If all of these two labrum and ligament are detached, the anterior labrum and inferior ligament are detached from the glenoid antero inferiorly, it is called fibrous pancreas. But if part of the bone is fractured, this is called osseous pancreas, and usually there is another bone change is called hill sacs deformity. So if we look here, there is glenoid rim fracture inferiorly, and this is typical for following sub uh, dislocation or subluxation, and this is what we call osseous pancreas. This will show you the, the lesions which can occur. Here is anterior and here is posterior. Here is anterior inferior. So if you look here, this is anterior. If you look here, this is inferior because this is coronal. And this there is fracture of the glenoid rim inferiorly or fracture of the glenoid rim anteriorly and this will form what we call osseous pancreas. Osseous pancreas is detachment of the anterior labrum, anterior labrum, and inferior glenohumeral ligament with detached glenoid rim. And the same here, it is this one is the same, but this is inferior, this is anterior, anterior and inferior, and they are both related to each other. Now coming here. Bankart lesion is the detachment of the glenoid ligament and anterior, anterior labrum. So the anterior labrum and the inferior glenohumeral ligament are detached by Bankart lesion. If involving the glenoid bone, it is called osseous Bankart. If not involving the glenoid bone, rim and this will be called fibrous pancreas. If this bone comes down like that with in dislocation there will be posterior superior impaction of this part here and this will result in erosion and this is called hill sax lesion. So hill sax lesion is due to Dislocation of the humerus down, this head will come here, and this posterior superior aspect will be hinged here, and thus it can be associated with glenoid rim fracture and destruction of the posterior superior part of the humerus. To gather all together, pancart lesion is no more, no more than an anterior liberal injury. But anterior liberal injury is usually associated with inferior ligament injury. And both occur following dislocation or subluxation. If both occur alone, anterior liberal and inferior ligament, this is called fibrous pancreas. But, but if the glenoid rim is fractured, or the humerus is impacted and showing destruction of the posterior superior part. This will be called osseous pancreas, and in this case, we will find either glenoid rim fracture or what we call hill sacs deformity posterior superior, or both of them. And this is a typical appearance in the plain film 
of a glenoid ring fracture as seen in osseous pancart and this is what is seen in CT anteriorly this is anterior this is a sternum this is anterior and this is inferior because this is coronal so anterior or antero inferior glenoid rim fracture is typical for osseous pancart and this one show a diagram showing that if this head is dislocated down it will be hinged here there will be injury of the labrum anteriorly injury of the capsule inferiorly and a glenoid rib rim fracture which could be anterior or inferior or, or a big one and at the same time that part of the head which will be dislocated here it comes in contact with this area so this will come will re re result in an erosion called hill sacs lesion so this is bankart lesion which is related of course we said related to dislocation in which we get linear tear up to avulsion of the inferior glenoid uh, inferior glenohumeral ligament and labrum with fracture of the glenoid to be osseous with posterolateral humeral head erosion to say to uh, name this as hill sacs so hill sacs whose glenoid fracture are component of osseous pancart either both of them or one of them in addition to labrum tear liberal tear anterior inferior or anterior with glenoid ligament disruption this is fibrous pancart and osseous pancart if you have hill sac and if you have glenoid rim both constitute osseous pancart lesion any of them or both now see this one here we have the anterior labrum detached this is an axial t t1 weighted image uh, axial t2 weighted image sorry arthrography this is axial t1 weighted image or arthrography uh, with fat suppression at the level of the inferior glenoid lib labrum demonstrating avulsion and displacement of the liberal ligamentous complex from the anteroinferior aspect of the glenoid with complete disruption of the scapular periosteum. The periosteum here is detached. This is what we called fibrous bankart. This is an arthrogram fat suppression T1. Fibrous bankart. Only the anteroinferior part of the labrum. Anteroinferior part of the labrum. Here we have the separate fragment and the hill sacs. So this is a bony pancart. Bony pancart could be due to could be a liberal tear associated with fracture or liberal tear associated with hill sacs or liberal tear associated with both of them. Bony pancart. Then we have pancart variants, and I think we should stop here to give a chance for somebody to relax uh, thank you we'll continue just soon